Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Yeah, you heard me. Dot XYZ. That's a great site there. Great little, it's a simple, simple site that I made there for the RLM Radio. So check it out when you get an opportunity. All right. So uh, welcome to the, fo- the show, folks. This is episode 60, 60 of uh, the Grim Leftover Show. And, and I thought of something as I was filling out the uh, the blog there. <laughs> today, today... Um, is February 24th and, and uh which is my half birthday half birthday and on my last birthday I turned 59 and my next birthday I'll turn 60 so on this half birthday it went from episode 59 to episode 60 I know it means nothing just something I noticed for whatever reason <laughs> Anyway, welcome to everybody out there tuning in from all the various places you may be tuned in from out there, uh, whether it would be right here on reallibertymedia.com, on, on the show page for The Grim Leftovers, or possibly on the rlmradio.xyz, maybe you're on freedomsnetwork.com or realliberty.org. You could have seen the tweet wherever and tuned in from using your, your own uh, local audio streaming tool. Or whatever. Uh, we're, we're out there in various other places as well. So uh, welcome to the show. Hopefully you're all doing good. Um, let's see what's going on here in the chat. Anything interesting? Not really. Anyway, let me say hi and howdy to the folks that are over here in the chat. Uh, I, see a, I see a group of folks over here. Yeah, we got the barman. Barman! <laughs> Beetle who had a birthday yesterday. Uh, I think he's, what, 43? Something? I don't know how old he is. 50, baby. Uh, we got Cowboy Tech and uh, myself and the Moose Girl. And Miss Kate, how you doing, Miss Kate? Anti and Asmo, Chelsea, don't even miss Circle, 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 uh, The Frumpster, looking for an SD card of some description, apparently. Miss Graham Z, the lovely Graham Z. Uh, Java Doctor and J Dread. Hey, Hansel! Hansel, let me, let me put the thing in there now, so in case anybody, in case anybody misses it. Uh, Mr. Meister, Mooster Brow, Mooster Brow. Paraquat, which is Prince, actually, but uh, not. Uh, by the way, if, if I hadn't mentioned it prior, I'll mention it now. The uh, Power Hour, the, the Prince show there, will be changing from Thursday night to probably Saturday evening. I, he's, he's, he's still working on that to let me know. Uh, we got Rob Works. Hope you're feeling well there, Rob. Uh, Rome's and Vanna and Weatherdork and the Phantom. Uh, we got CC66, Chosker, the Cyborg Noodle, and uh, Siv Grummet, JJ's. JJ's is, uh, oh, if you're, if you're following JJ's over there on the Twitter, uh, check it out. Check out his, his Twitter feed. He's, he's got a friend he's trying to help out that needs some, some assistance, and maybe you can uh, see it in your heart to do so. We have Kiss and Pwn Saucy, Quasimodo. Uh, the sock puppet. Uh, Mike, Mike just joined us. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Uh, we got the slim Jim Flim, who is happy, happy, happy today. He uh, had some uh, legal issues that got ironed out finally. Uh, yes, indeed. So, congrats on that, Slim Jim. We got Smartass in the Holiest of Rogers and Zipex. Zipex. <laughs> so, that's all the folks we got. We got in the chat, but I know there's other people out there check us, us out from other places. So uh, howdy to y'all, too, wherever you may be. All right. The chatters are quiet. Yes. The chatters are quiet. Well, they're not really that quiet. They're just chatting about stuff other than what I'm talking about. Because I haven't really talked about anything yet. But here we go. We got stories lined up for you. Uh, this first article... Let's see, is there a date on this thing? Yeah, there it is. January 23rd here. So about a month ago. Yep, over on theguardian.com. Huh. Space-baked cookies are now a thing. Space-baked cookies. Yeah. Yeah, Mike, it's live. It's really live. Uh, but they take two hours longer than on Earth. <laughs> Now, 
Now, that's a long extra time because it takes about uh, 20 minutes to bake a batch of cookies of, uh, of chocolate chip cookies that they have pictured here. So if it takes two hours longer, that's quite the thing. Of course, you do have to adjust for altitude uh, when you move up, but uh, I'm only, you know, 6,200 feet above uh, sea level, and I would guess the ISS is a little more than that. <laughs> so astronauts on the ISS baked chocolate chip cookies from raw ingredients for the first time, although uh, when this article was, was printed or produced on the Internet, no one had yet tasted them. Not quite that brave, huh? All right. <laughs> the results are finally in for the first chocolate chip cookie bake off in space. While looking at more or looking more or less normal, the best cookies require two hours of baking time last month up at the International Space Station. It takes far less time on Earth. It says here under 20 minutes, but like I said, you have to adjust for altitude, so it takes 20 minutes for mine. Uh, and how do they taste? No one knows. Still sealed in individual baking pouches and packed in their space flight container, the cookies remain frozen in a Houston area lab after splashing down two weeks ago in a SpaceX capsule. I want a space cookie. Can I have a space cookie? <laughs> they were they were the first food baked in space from raw ingredients. The the makers of the oven. Okay, you hadn't mentioned the oven yet. The makers of the oven expected a diff a difference in baking time, but not that big. There's a lot, still a lot to look in to figure out what's really driving that uh, difference there. But definitely a cool result. Mary Murphy, a manager for the Texas-based Nanorack, said this week, Overall, I think it's a pretty awesome first experiment. Located near NASA's Johnson Space Center, Nanorax designed and built the small electric oven. Is this like a, a Susie, Susie Bake Oven? What's the, what are those things called? <laughs> Easy bake oven. <laughs> yeah, spa uh, easy space bake oven. All right. L Luca Pomerantano, an Italian astronaut, was the master baker in December, radio radioing down a description as he baked them one by one. One by one. They take two hours each and you're baking them one by one. <laughs> The first cookie in the oven for 25 minutes at 300 degrees Fahrenheit ended up seriously underbaked. He more than doubled the baking time for the next two, and the results were still so-so. The fourth cookie stayed in the oven for two hours, and finally, success. Yeah, so this time, I do see some browning Parmignanto radioed. I can't... Uh, this is your, your tax dollars, I assume. Some of you out there pay taxes of some sort, some description. <laughs> Your tax dollars are going to baking cookies in space. <laughs> space cookies. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Put that in there again. These people, I, I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> All right. This next article I have for for you is old. It's old, but it's probably more relevant now than it was when it was new. And when I say it's old, it's four years old. Well, a little over three years old, but it was 2016, December 30th, 2016. Um, from theatlantic.com. And you, you'll you'll see you'll see why uh, it's more relevant now than it was when it first came out. The CDC's new quarantine rule could violate civil liberties. The proposed le regulation, not legislation, could be used to detain people without due process or examine them without informed consent. How do you spell corona? On August 15th, with little fanfare, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention... Yeah, right, that's what it stands for. Took steps to improve its ability to deal with infectious outbreaks. 
the agency proposed a new rule, a new, brand new rule, huh, that would expand its powers to screen, test, and quarantine people traveling into or within the United States in the event of a crisis like the historic Ebola outbreak in 2014. Why do they have powers? Who is the CDC to have powers? And when they say, we're writing a new rule for ourselves that gives us more power, based on what? <laughs> the hell? On the face of it, this sounds like a good thing. No, it does not. The threat of infectious disease is omnipresent and growing. Familiar threats like flu, Ebola, or measles continually rear their heads, often in new guises, while completely new dangers like MERS or SARS can take the world by surprise, or corona. Again, this is pre-corona. Oh, well, pre this version of corona. Uh, when that happens, the CDC must act quickly and decisively, and its new powers will purportedly help it to do so. But some epidemiologists, lawyers, and health organizations say that the rule, in its current form, poses serious threats to civil liberties, allowing authority to detain and examine people with little heed to due process or informed consent. They don't care about your consent. Your, your consent is the least of their concern. Due process? What the hell's that? That stuff's been thrown out the window. <laughs> they are giving themselves the benefit of the doubt, says Jennifer Nuzzo, an epidemiologist at UPMC Center for Health Security, and a co-author of a recent paper criticizing the proposed rule. I don't worry about the CDC. I worry about people above them making them do things they don't want to do because they've given themselves, they've given themselves these broad powers. They've given themselves. Why can't I just give myself broad powers such as that? Those powers will make their jobs easier. Well, gee, thanks. Until they don't. Yeah. They're giving, them broad, giving themselves broad powers. Wow. The CDC tried this play in 2005, proposing a rule that would have expanded their quarantine powers and required airlines to maintain a traveler database. But after a wave of critical comments, including from the travel industry, they shelved the rule. In its new incarnation, it's similar, but perhaps even broader in scope. It covers public health emergencies, which are defined as any communicable disease event, Wuhan, that the director thinks could spread. So it's based on this one guy's thought. Oh, that could happen, sure. Or it is highly likely to cause death or serious illness if not properly controlled. Like life, life is a, something that causes death or serious illness. All right. The director can be changed by the president at any time without Senate confirmation, by the way. Just for your edification. During such events, the CDC could screen people at airports and other transport hubs, apprehend those they suspect of being ill for three days, and potentially quarantine or isolate them pending a medical review. Well, three days ain't cutting it for this one, is it? They're quarantining them for two, two weeks at least. It is already authorized to detain people suspected of carrying diseases like plague, Ebola, and somewhat improbably, smallpox. But the new rule does away with the formal list. It extends the same powers, self-granted powers, to any quarantinable communicable disease. And uses a wider range of symptoms from a list of 
that federal agents can update as the need arises for defining ill people. There are good reasons behind the semantic expansions. The current system was enshrined in 1944 and needs an update in the face of diseases that have arisen since. For example, the existing warning symptoms don't cover many important signs of known diseases like Ebola and MERS. Meanwhile, new and unknown Ill illnesses are emerging all the time. The CDC, trying to equip itself with sufficient flexibility to respond to diseases we've never even heard of in a way where it doesn't have to revisit these rules every few years, said James Hodge, Jr., a professor of public health law and ethics at Arizona State. I'm supportive of that. Well, yeah, you're one of them. Of course you're supportive of that. <laughs> but Hodge, Nuzzo, and others feel the CDC risks sacrificing personal liberty at the altar of flexibility and expediency. Of course they do. They are God, don't you know? They can do whatever they want. They can grant themselves new powers whenever they decide that's the right thing for them to do. <sighs> this is not a standard that, su that survives constitutional scrutiny. Not that it will ever be brought before any constitutional scrutiny. Not in any really relevant way, because they'll just say, well, you're not dying or sick, and we didn't detain you, so you have no standing. Well, you're saying you can if you want to. Yeah, but you, well, we didn't yet, so you have no standing. For a start, the rule is sparse when it comes to due process. It allows the CDC to detain travelers indefinitely before deciding whether to quarantine them. So you could be detained forever. And then if they say it's a quarantine, then they can keep you for three days. So that's why you're not here. You're hearing that these people are being detained rather than quarantined, saying only that the agency doesn't expect such app doesn't expect. There's a good phrase. Uh, uh, such apprehensions to last for more than 72 hours. It doesn't make provisions for legal counsel if people can't afford a lawyer themselves. And it puts any review of the agency's decisions under the auspices of its own employees. <laughs> oh, using the rule, a future administration could hold travelers in government custody for days or weeks or months or years without providing an explanation or any opportunity for the individuals to challenge their detentions. The rule also gives the CDC ultimate authority, ultimate, to carry out medical tests and treatments, stating that the individual's consent shall not be considered as a prerequisite uh, to the exercise of any authority. Your consent not considered. <laughs> that is medically unethical, says Hodge, since informed consent has been a bedrock of medicine for decades. If you don't get it, you could have additional quarantine, but you don't get to force informed consent on people. Well, if they're forcing it on you, it's not consent, is it? <laughs> Perhaps the most striking thing about the criticisms is how easy it would be for the CDC to have its cake and eat it. Uh, th there are really basic due process steps that could be put in place that would not undermine the CDC's powers. Oh, they love that word, powers, don't they? But that would put in checks and balances so that when the powers are exercised, it's done in a way that respects civil liberties, says Alexandra Filon in Georgetown Law School. The stickier problem is that there is little evidence to support screening or quarantining travelers. Consider the Ebola outbreak. The CDC screened more than 38,000 travelers 
flying into the United States by interviewing them and checking their medical records. They then monitored over 10,000 people for 21 days, and they caught exactly zero, zero cases of Ebola. You might ask, so what? Why take the chance? Why not ensure that we'll catch the rare exceptions in the future? Here's the thing, and it bears emphasizing. What you think would work in an outbreak often does not work. In these situations, so-called common sense can completely backfire. With Ebola, said Nuzo, screening does not work. You're not transmissible until you're really sick, and then you're not moving. It's uh, telling that Thomas Duncan, a li libra Liberian man who was diagnosed with Ebola while visiting family in Dallas, did not spread the virus to anyone in his family or community. He only transmitted it to two nurses who were caring for him long after it was obvious that he had the Ebola. Quarantines could also have serious consequences. You create the expectation that you could keep cases out by monitoring them, and there's no evidence this can be done, says Nuzo. If, this, if the disease does not enter the country, that would seriously damage the credibility of health workers, the CDC included. When Dr. Craig Spencer fell sick with Ebola in New York after having helped with the outbreak in Guinea, he was vilified. People went on a witch hunt to find all the places he'd been to or eaten at, even though there was no risk of him spreading the virus at any of those places. If we start monitoring people, it enforces that message. The distrust and confusion will be exacerbated if people fear that they will be quarantined unfairly. Cases will go underground and diseases will spread. And if the health workers share those fears, they will be unwilling to travel to outbreak zones to help. That happened in the last Ebola outbreak. Thanks to CDC's quarantines, the number of American health workers traveling to West Africa fell by 25%. Many worried that they would lose their jobs if they were isolated for weeks upon their return. Quarantine also creates severe stigma. In 2014, two public health workers and a family of six Liberian immigrants were uh, quarantined in Connecticut. Because they like beetles, that's why though none of them had, had been exposed to Ebola or posed any threat to the public health, the state confined these individuals to their homes for weeks. Uh, according to um, Roth and Edwards, who represented them, the state failed to provide these individuals with food or other basic necessities and failed to inform them that they had the legal right to challenge those quarantine orders in court. To this day, Liberian Americans in Connecticut experience shame and stigma as a result of the wrongly uh, of, of wrongly being labeled a threat to public health. By contrast, other states use far less restrictive measures, uh, like daily phone calls with health workers that provided uh, to be to prove to be just as effective. Rather than immediately shoot, uh, shooting for quarantines. The CDC could amend their rule to use sub such options where possible. How the CDC will react to these criticisms is unclear. I can tell you how they're going to react. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to say, say what you want. We gave ourselves power, and we'll keep giving ourselves power. <laughs> they left the rule online for a two-month period of public comment that ended October 14th, and you didn't hear about it until after that. Important people in this field did not know about this until the comment period had closed. If I was CDC and wanted to put these regulations through and make them as good as possible, I wouldn't publish an 88-page document and hope whoever needs to know sees it in two months. Still, the agency did receive 15,794 comments. The vast majority of those were crank-like and incoherent, says Hodge, who reviewed them all. Around 500 to 600 were meaningful. 
and came from health agencies like Doctors Without Borders, uh, legal scholars, the airline industry, and more. The CDC has to respond to these and then issue its final rule, which must be approved by senior members of the Department of Health and Human Services and potentially by the Trumpster. <laughs> anyway, that, that's how it works. They grant themselves power. They grant themselves license to do whatever the hell they damn well please. They say, we can do this. There. We can do it. That's all it takes. It's just that simple. It's crazy. It's crazy. <sighs> all right. Back to something newer. January 27, 2020, on MotherboardVice.com. Now, hang on a second. Let me get a sip of water here. All right. <laughs> All right. A lot of you out there, and, and actually myself included, on one of my computers uses an antivirus program called Avast. But this, and although this article is kind of about Avast, it's not really about Avast. It's about all of the various, quote, free, unquote, antivirus programs, and not limited to antivirus programs either. But antivirus programs uh, are, mm, they go deeper because they monitor, you know, when you go and visit a website, the antivirus program knows about that website uh, because it's monitoring your web activity to keep you safe. <laughs> there you go. Leaked documents expose the secretive market for your web browsing data. Secretive. And a vast antivirus subsidiary sells every search, every click, every buy on on every site, its clients have included Home Depot, Google, Microsoft, Pepsi, and McKinsey. I don't know what McKinsey is. Anyway, they updated this uh, on uh, the I think a couple of days after it came out. It says on Thursday, uh, and and after this investigation, Avast announced it will stop the jump shot data collection and wind down jump shots operation with immediate effect. Uh, and they, they tell you about it. But uh, so Avast said that. What about all the rest of the ones out there? Avera, AVG, uh, on and on, Hitman Pro, uh, various other ones, you know. Okay, so an antivirus program used by hundreds of millions of people around the world is selling highly sensitive web browsing data to many of the world's biggest companies. A joint investigation by Motherboard and PC Mag has found our report relies on leaked user data, data, contracts, and other company documents that show the sale of this data is both highly sensitive and, as in many cases, supposed to remain confidential between the company selling the data and the clients purchasing it. The documents from a subsidiary of the antivirus giant Avast called JumpShot shine new light on the secret of sale and supply chain of people's internet browsing histories. They show that a vast antivirus program installed on a person's computer collects data and that JumpShot repackages that data into various different products that are then sold to many of the largest companies in the world. Some past, present, and potential clients include Google, Yelp, Microsoft, McKinsey, Pepsi, Home Depot, Condé Nast, Intuit, and many, many others. Some clients paid millions of dollars for products that include a so-called all-clicks feed, which can track a user's behavior, clicks, and movement across websites in highly precise detail. Avast claims to have more than 435 million active users per month, and JumpShot said it has data from 100 million devices. 
Avast collects data from users that opt in, then provides that to JumpShot, but multiple Avast users have told Motherboard they were not aware Avast was selling browsing data. Now, I'll just jump, jump on down here because um, I think this is the article that also showed you how to prevent that on Avast. Um, it may not be in this article. Either way, um, there, there is a way in Avast to set it so that it does not <laughs> record that data and send that data to Avast. So Avast won't have the information to, to send out uh, to, the, to the data mining folk. Now, I, I, you may have a different uh, antivirus if you're running a Windows, uh, but there should be a way, depending on what your antivirus program is, to prevent that from happening. I run on my machine here Malwarebytes, and Malwarebytes does not sell the data to anybody, and you can shut off them even getting the information. So it, it's pretty nice. And so Malwarebytes is, has been the uh, uh, my my antivirus anti malware of choice for many years now. Um, so if you want to look into that, it's not free. There's there's no free version of malware bytes except for an instant repair kind of thing. Like if you get infected with something, they will recommend you to download the malware bytes instant scan thing to fix your computer. Um, but uh, if you want to use malware bytes, as uh, I think they give you 30 days, test it out or something like that. But after that, if you want to have real time monitoring, which you need to have if you're running Windows computer, you need to have malware bytes. Um, <laughs> I mean, you need to have a real time monitoring. Uh, then, then you definitely want to check check out this program and uh, potentially pay for it uh, because it, it, it's good. It's really good. Um, so, anyway, and it, it doesn't see malware bytes doesn't care about new virus definitions. They have a whole other way of looking at viruses. So uh, the brand new ones coming out are not going to get you. All right. Speaking of tracking you, <laughs> from January 26th here on uh, campusreform.org, Mizzou students required to install location tracking app so the college can pinpoint them. They want to know where you are. They want to know what you're up to. They want to know who you're hanging out with. And they want to know what you're doing. The University of Missouri has started using an app in order to track students' locations to measure attendance in classes. Yeah, that's not all they're doing. While the student-athletes are required to use the app, new students or not athletes will have the ability to opt in for now. Soon, it will not be opt-in. <laughs> New student-athletes at the University of Missouri are being required to participate in a tracking program designed to measure and enforce class attendance, a university spokesman confirmed to campus reform following a report from the Kansas City Star. Despite privacy concerns, eh, your privacy means nothing. <laughs> Officials defended the decision as one to the benefit of students and school athletics departments has already been using the app. Spotter, EDU, uh, that's the name of it, Spotter, yeah, Spotter, uh, to track certain student athletes. While athletes are required to use the app, new students who are not athletes will be able to opt in. Why would you want to? Uh, the Mizzou spokesman clarified the campus reform. Participation in the pilot, it's a pilot, offered to fewer than 2% of MU students is completely optional. If a student does not want to use the app to track their attendance, they will be required to check in through their professor through an alternate method, such as signing an attendance sheet. I would opt for signing the attendance sheet if I were you. Um, Spotter EDU, developed by a former basketball coach, is designed to monitor a user's attendance by pinpointing students 
within a classroom until they leave, providing continuous, reliable, and it says here, non-invasive attendance. That seems pretty invasive to me. According to the app's website, it's non-invasive. While the app ensures that students are in the classroom during class times, it claims it does not track students' location anywhere else. Right. Now, maybe, possibly, <laughs> like, maybe you didn't want to go to class that day, one of your teammates did, you just say, hey, take my phone and carry it on in there to the classroom. <laughs> We only care if students are in class, during class. No GPS tracking means we can't locate, locate them anywhere else. Yeah. I, I trust them about as far as I can throw um, somebody big. I don't know. Name somebody big, that person. <laughs> as far as I can throw Donald Trump. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> this one just made me laugh. The, the only reason I brought this next article up is it made me laugh. The headline from PressTV.com, January 27th. Iran-Russia ties advancing against U.S. will. Aw, they aren't, they aren't bowing down and licking the boot of the U.S. government. Aw, that's according to President Rouhani of Iran. Yeah, he, Iran, Iran, the president of Iran says bilateral relations between Iran and Russia are rapidly advancing despite the will and intention of the United States. Rouhani made the remark in a meeting with uh, the visiting chairman of Russia's state Duma Vachikalasaka Voledin, whatever, in Tehran on Monday. I stand assured that in spite of Washington's pressures on the region and Iran in particular, the two countries will expand their relations more than ever before, regardless of what of the White House's will and intention, Rouhani said. Underlining that Iran is by no way interested in the spread of tensions across the region, Rouhani said regional stability is of significance to Iran and Russia, and we are, we are ready, as in the past, to further cooperation and deliberation between the two countries. The Iranian president also noted that trilateral relations between Iran Russia, and China, as well as the joint maritime drills in the Sea of Oman, indicate that the trio are bent on developing closer ties with each other. Rouhani expressed hope that all of the previous agreements between Tehran and Moscow for the promotion of joint investment will enter into force as soon as possible. Volodin, for his part, said despite increased tensions in the region, we should work towards diffusing tensions and expanding ties without allowing such tensions to drift us apart. He added that the most important points raised during discussions within the framework of the two countries' joint economic commission included the expansion of trade ties between the two countries, adding, we believe that we can reach better conclusions uh, through more meetings. The United States is just pushing the pushing the region towards international dictatorship. Anyway, there's a little more to the story, but you get the idea. Iran basically said, you know, U.S., if you want to do business dealings with us and uh, deal with us in a fair manner, uh, quit putting sanctions on us, then um, we'll deal with you. But until that time, we still got stuff to do, and we're still going to do it whether it's with you or with somebody you consider uh, to, to be not your friend, like Russia or China, which you consider them to be friends at certain times, but not so much at other times. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Get another sip of water here. All right, all right. 
Activist Post, January 28, 2020. Johnson and Johnson, yeah, those people that make the baby powder, advised coronavirus simulation and now stands to gain financially with a new vaccine. Imagine that. Prior to the coronavirus outbreak, the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security hosted an event uh, 201, a high-level pandemic exercise focused on a coronavirus outbreak. Yes, they ran a simulation of exactly what we see unfolding right now, just before it happened. The pandemic exercise was conducted in partnership with the World Economic Forum and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Shocker! <laughs> During Event 201, Johnson & Johnson was asked specifically about the coronavirus vaccine. When asked, the Johnson & Johnson representative uh, talked about the need for regulatory flexibility for an accelerated vaccine financing in business. Not once did he mention the safety or effectiveness. In today's news, we see that Johnson & Johnson are currently working on a vaccine, and they're pretty confident they can develop one quickly. <laughs> Did Bill Gates and the World Economic Forum predict coronavirus outbreak? They have a link here for that. And they have links for other things, too, uh, that are uh, specifically dealing with Event 201 and uh, the Johnson & Johnson boondoggle uh, where they're going to make billions, trillions of dollars. I don't know how much they're going to make. They're going to make a lot of money uh, off of this vaccine. Helped, of course, along by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, oh, no, it was a total accident. We don't know where this virus came from. Of course not. <laughs> All right. From the Electronic Frontier Foundation, or EFF, if you will, on uh, January 29th, UK police will soon be able to search through United States data without asking a judge. Law enforcement officials in the United States and the UK have negotiated a deal that sells out the privacy rights of the public in both nations. For Americans, it will effectively abrogate Fourth Amendment protections and subject their data to search and seizure by foreign police. This is all going to start happening within a few months, unless Congress does something to stop it now. Of course, Congress has no interest in stopping it. That's why we're launching an action today, asking you out there to reach out to your members of Congress and tell them, tell them to introduce a joint resolution that could put a halt to the deal. If it is not stopped, the worst parts of this deal will likely come standard on future agreements and Americans will be subject to more and more searches by foreign police. The full text of the U.S.-U.K. cloud agreement Cloud Act Agreement was unveiled in November, and it's just as bad as we thought it would be. We joined with 19 other privacy, civil liberties, and human rights organizations and sent the letter to Congress going through a long list of problems with the first Cloud Act deal. Some of the key problems with the U.S.-U.K. agreement include the agreement includes weak standard for review, that does not meet the Fourth Amendment's warrant requirement. No warrant, no judge, no nothing. You got data, it's their data. There's no prior judicial authorization required. The deal includes no safeguards for free expression. The people put under surveillance do not need to be notified that they're on any, uh, on any level that they are being surveilled. The minimization procedures meant to protect U.S. persons are unfair, unequal, and won't do the job. It will grant real-time, real access 
to communications allowing foreign police to wiretap Americans' conversations, ignoring the high requirements for a wiretap under U.S. law. These extraordinary search powers uh, given to the... They just love giving themselves powers, don't they? Uh, given, given to foreign police can be used even for relatively low-level crimes, like posting a meme. In colonial times, the British military used general warrants to search through houses and seize property. This practice was part of what fueled the American Revolution and formed the basis for the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Congress should not let an executive agreement no negotiated behind closed doors give away rights that have been enshrined in U.S. law for nearly 250 years. Well, the Constitution means nothing any longer. The Constitution has been shit upon and used to wipe butts with. Yes, yes it has. And um, if you think the Constitution means anything at all anymore, uh, you, you, are, you are quite mistaken. Very, very much mistaken. Uh, if you think the Congress is out there looking out for your benefit, for your rights, and protecting that document you think protects you, this all-important, totally enshrined document that has been violated, every part of it has been violated, especially the Bill of Rights just totally torn apart. Uh, and th those mean nothing anymore. So, I, you know, you can write to Congress all you want. I, I don't really think they care one way or the other. Um, I'm pretty sure, I'm almost positive they don't care. <laughs> but but uh, go ahead and write them. Maybe it'll make you feel better. Maybe it'll make you help you sleep better at night. I don't know. Now, I bring this up because earlier today, I saw another article saying, yes, this is true. Animals can be infected by the Wuhan coronavirus. But this article from USAHitman.com, posted February 1st, says exactly that. Pets can carry Wuhan coronavirus too. A Chinese epidemiologist warned this week that the no novel novel Wuhan coronavirus is not limited to communication between humans. Dr. Li Longjuan of the Chinese National Health Commission made clear that mammals are generally at risk of passing the virus. If pets go out and have contact with an infected person or another infected animal, they have the chance to get infected. By then, pets need to be isolated. In addition to people, we should be careful with other mammals, especially pets, she told China Central Television, CCTV. Uh, Chinese news outlets and the World Health Organization report that pet-to-person transmission remains theoretically, as of now, <laughs> the WHO uh, declared an international emergency on Thursday, although this being uh, 23 days later, still not a pandemic. Um, the United States is currently dealing with confirmed cases of coronavirus in Illinois, Arizona, California, Washington State. Um, like I said, it's 23 days ago, so more now. And that was on January 31st. So, according to the CDC, on Friday morning, the New York Daily News reported that NYPD officers were warned to avoid Elmhurst Hospital in Queens due to a potential case. The first domestic person-to-person -person transmission was announced Thursday in Illinois uh, due to statements from the CDC and WHO, elements of the United States travel industry are taking new precautions. Delta and American Airlines announced halts to travel to China on that Friday after a after a leading pilots union filed a lawsuit in Dallas County, Texas. The U.S. State Department issued a do not travel advisory for all of China on Thursday. The level four advisory is the most severe 
and on par with nations like Syria, Afghanistan, and cartel war-torn regions of Mexico. Uh, those currently in China should consider departing using commercial means. The Department of State has requested that all non-essential U.S. government personnel defer travel to China in light of the novel coronavirus, the Federal Advisory States. There is a link at the bottom of this, should you care to read more, over at Breitbart.com. However, be aware, like I said, this is uh, basically three-week-old information, um, and there's a lot more better current information out there available for you. There is. All right, so... Speaking of pets, do you have a pet? Do you like your pet? Are you good to your pet? Do you treat your pet well? Do you call your pet a pet? Well, calling your pet a pet, according to PETA, <laughs> is derogatory. You, you, you are hurting that, that poor animal's feels. That pet, that pet has feelings too, you know. And you calling him a pet. Uh, the head of the People for Ethical Treatment of Animals, PETA, said that it is derogatory to call animals pets. And owners should instead call their beloved animals companions. Well, why can't you call them both? Well, PETA President Ingrid Newkirk claimed that the term pets suggests that animals are mere decorations or commodities or lunch. Animals are not pets. They are not your cheap burglar alarm, or sometimes they are, or something which allows you to go out for a walk. They are not ours as decoration or toys. They are living beings, Newkirk said on Friday. Now, she doesn't really explain why pets means that they're decorative or commodities. <laughs> she just says that's what that word now means. The 70-year-old animal rights activist compared calling animals pets to the treatment of women before the feminist movement. Well, sometimes women are pets, too. And I'm sure women consider some men pets. You know, pets are pets. What's the big deal? PETA's website goes in seam with Newkirk's statement, devoting an entire page to companion animals frequently asked questions. Newkirk's comments also come upon the recent release of her book, imagine that, Animal Kind, Remarkable Discoveries About Animals and Revolutionary New Ways to Show Them Compassion. The far left, and I, I don't know what that has to do with anything, but the far left group has also recently called for the retirement of groundhog Punxsutawney Phil, saying the groundhog should be sent out to a sanctuary to live out the remainder of his life uh, and be re re replaced with a robotic version. Let me tell you something about Punxsutawney Phil right now. Punxsutawney Phil supposedly springs up every year on February 2nd, and if he sees his shadow... That means you get six more weeks of winter. Or is it the other way around? I always get that confused. Well, the thing is, it doesn't matter. All you have to do to determine whether or not this rodent is going to see his shadow is look at the sky. If you see it's overcast, he's not going to see his shadow. <laughs> Otherwise, he will. <laughs> So, so, and and he's wrong two thirds of the time. Well, not he being wrong; he's just a rodent popping out of a hole. But, but the, the predictions attributed to Punxsutawney Phil are wrong. Either way, if I have an a, a, an animal, a pet, a dog, cat, whatever, bird, I don't, I don't know about birds. Uh, it's not only a companion, not only a companion, but it is a pet. And it is a friend. And it is a family member. 
It goes far beyond being a companion. But she doesn't seem to get that. She just wants to make this one word for no explainable reason. Call it derogatory. She can go straight to hell. All right. This next article, if you, all had, all, if, if you had already read this article, then you would know what I'm going to talk about. But if you hadn't got to it yet, then, then maybe this will be helpful so you'll know what I'm going to talk about in future shows. <laughs> OMTimes.com Four keys to develop your sixth sense. Four keys. Just that simple. Yeah. Our sixth sense or intuitive abilities are as powerful and beneficial as any of our other senses, even more so in some instances, so it pays to develop your sixth sense. Recognizing and developing our intuition adds a whole new dimension to our lives, empowering us with confidence. Everyone receives intuitive information every day, so in reality we are all intuitive. We receive these messages in four different ways, which we explore in this person's classes. They are clairvoyance. This is when you know something without knowing how. Oh, that, that was claircognizance. No, no, never mind. Clairvoyance, where you see things in your mind's eye and are visual. Clairaudience, where you hear things in your mind's ear and possibly with your physical ears. And clairsentience, when you feel a physical sensation somewhere in your body. So claircognance, that's a weird word, claircognance, all right, uh, is, is knowing something without knowing how. That's the one you want to know. Okay, or I, I would think you'd want to. Uh, each person is initially predisposed to receive information through one particular method. What intimidates some of this person's students is they discount any messages as just their own thoughts and therefore feel inadequate. The ways we explore uh, intuition in my animal communication classes. Uh, what, what happened there? Stop that. Still, oh, I must have right-clicked on something. It went away. Anyway, I, it goes through the various ways here. Sense of sight, sense of hearing, sense of smell, sense of feeling or touch. Um, there's more to it than those, by the way, let me tell you. Um, but but uh, this is this person's. Uh, informational thing that you may find um, interesting um, to some degree or another. Her, her name is Naomi McDonald, and uh, she wants to sell you on some class. But uh, there you go. There you go. Uh, four keys to develop your sixth sense. I'm sure there are better guides out there uh, should you decide you want to become more ESP type person. <laughs> all right <laughs> that'll close out episode 60 here today um i will be back next week with episode 61 remember it's still february which means it's still the rlm donation month and by the way if you're out there listening rex my dog rex not my pet not my companion only know him by nickname uh Thank you so much for your very generous donation to Real Liberty Media yesterday. But for the rest of you, uh, feel free to click that donate button over there on reallibertymedia.com and uh, send a few bucks our way. We always appreciate it. It's it's a wonderful thing. All right, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow coming on at 3 p.m. Eastern is In a Perfect World with Flash and possibly a co-hostage or two. Uh, there in the middle of the day so um, look forward to that and uh, check the schedule there on reallibertymedia.com for all the rest of the shows that come up throughout the week also 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 let me remind you you listening and those of you listening that may know somebody that if somebody wants to do a show here on rlm radio contact me tell me about it let me let me help them get set up if that's what they want um <laughs> Frumpy, you're a freak. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, I'd love we'd it'd, we'd love to have more shows. It would be great. 
and uh, we we would love to host you over here on RLM Radio, RealLibertyMedia.com. Y'all have a great rest of your week and a great evening. Peace.